Hello and welcome. My name is Alan. Today we're doing more. A Testament of Hope, the speeches and writings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Grab your drink, pull you up a seat. Let's go ahead and hop into this. Piece of it we are reading is Bull Connor's Birmingham. As we continue why we can't wait. If you had visited Birmingham before the 3rd of April in the 100th anniversary of the Negro's emancipation, you might have come to a startling conclusion. You might have concluded that here was a city which had been trapped for decades in a Rip Van Winkle chamber, a city whose fathers had apparently never heard of Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, the Bill of Rights, the preamble to the Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, or the 1954 decision of the United States Supreme Court outlawing segregation in public schools. If your powers of imagination were great enough to enable you to place yourself in the position of a Negro baby born and brought up to physical maturity in Birmingham, you would have pictured your life in the following manner. You would be born in a Jim Crow hospital to parents who probably lived in a ghetto. You would attend a Jim Crow school. It is not really true that the city fathers had never heard of the Supreme Court school desegregation order. They had heard of it, and since it, its passage, and consistently expressed their defiance. Typified by the prediction of one official that blood would run in the streets before desegregation would be permitted to come to Birmingham. You would spend your childhood playing mainly in the streets because the colored parks were abysmally inadequate when a federal court order banned park segregation. You would find that Birmingham closed down its parks and gave up its baseball team rather than integrate them. If you went shopping with your mother or father, you would trudge along as they purchased at every counter except one in the large or small stores. If you were hungry or thirsty, you would have to forget about it until you got back to the Negro section of town. For in your city, it was a violation of the law to serve food to Negroes at the same counter with whites. If your family attended church, you would go to a Negro church. If you wanted to visit a church attended by white people, you would not be welcome. For although your white fellow citizens would insist that they were Christians, they practiced segregation as rigidly as the house of God as they did in the uh, theater. If you loved music and you earned to hear the Metropolitan Op Opera on its tour of the South, you could not enjoy this privilege. Nor could your white fellow music lovers for the Metropolitan had discontinued scheduling Birmingham on its national tours, uh, 
after it had adopted a policy of not performing before segregated audiences. If you wanted to contribute to and be a part of the work of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, you would not be able to join a local branch. In the state of Alabama, segregationist authorities had been successful in, in joining the NAACP from performing its civil rights work by declaring it a foreign corporation and rendering its activities illegal. If you wanted a job in this city, one of the greatest iron and steel producing centers in the nation, you had better settle on doing many a work as a porter or laborer. If you were fortunate enough to get a job, you could expect that promotions um, to a better status or more pay would come, not to you, but to a white employee, regardless of your comparative talents. On your job, you would eat in a separate place and use a water fountain and la lavatory labeled color in conformity to citywide ordinances. If you believed your history books, and thought of America as a country whose governing officials, whether city, state, or nation, are selected by the governed, you would be swiftly disillusioned when you tried to exercise your right to register and vote. You would be confronted with every conceivable obstacle to taking the most important walk a Negro American can take today, a, the walk to the ballot box. On the 80,000, of the 80,000 voters in Birmingham, prior to January 1963, only 10,000 were Negroes. Your race, constituting two-thirds of the city's population, would make up one-eighth of its voting strength. You would be living in a city where brutality directed against Negroes was an unquestioned and unchallenged reality. One of the city commissioners, a member of the body, that ruled municipal affairs would be Eugene Bull Connor, a racist who prided himself on knowing how to handle the Negro and keep him in his place. As Commissioner of Public Safety, Bull Connor entrenched for many years in a key position in the Birmingham power structure, displayed as much contempt for the rights of the Negro as he did defiance for the authority of the federal government. You would have found a general atmosphere of violence and brutality in Birmingham. Local racists have intimidated, mobbed, and even killed Negroes with impunity. One of the more vivid and recent examples of the terror of Birmingham was the castration of a Negro man whose mutilated body had been abandoned on a lonely road. No Negro home was protected from bombings and burnings. From the year 1957 through January of 1963, while Birmingham was still claiming that its Negroes were satisfied, 17 unsolved bombings of Negro churches and homes of civil rights leaders had occurred. Negroes were not the only persons who suffered because of Bull Connor's rule. It was Birmingham's safety commissioner who in 1961 arrested the manager of the local, local bus station 
when the latter sought to obey the law of the land by serving Negroes. Although a federal district judge condemned Connor in strong terms for his action and released the victim, the fact remained that in Birmingham early in 1963, no places of public accommodation were integrated except the bus station, the train station, and the airport. In Bull Connor's Birmingham, you would be a resident of the city where a United States Senator visiting to deliver a speech had been arrested because he walked through a door marked colored. In Connor's Birmingham, the silent password was fear. It was a fear not only of on the part of black oppressed, but also in the hearts of the white oppressors. Guilt was a part of their fear. There was also the dread of change, that all too prevalent fear, which hounds those whose attitudes have been hardened by the long winter of reaction. Many were apprehensive of social ostracism. Certainly, Birmingham had its white moderates who disapproved of Bull Connor's tactics. Certainly, Birmingham had its decent white citizens who privately deplored the maltreatment of Negroes, but they remained publicly silent. It was a silence born of fear, fear of social, political, and economic reprisals. The ultimate tragedy of Birmingham was not the brutality of the bad people, but the silence of the good people. In Birmingham, you would be living in a community where the white man's long-lived tyranny had cowed your people, led them to abandon hope, and developed in them a false sense of inferiority. You would be living in a city where the representatives of economic and political power refused to even discuss social justice with the leaders of your people. You would be living in the largest city of a police state president uh, presided over by Governor George Wallace, whose inauguration had uh, inauguration vow had been a pledge of segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. You would be living, in fact, in the most segregated city in America. There was one threat to the reign of white supremacy in Birmingham. As an outgrowth of the Montgomery bus boycott, protest movements had sprung up in numerous cities across the South. In Birmingham, one of the nation's most creative Creation, courageous freedom fighters, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, had organized the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, the ACHR, in the spring of 1956. Shuttlesworth, a wiry, energetic, and indomitable man, had set out to change Birmingham and to end for all time the terrorist racist rule of Bull Connor. When Shuttlesworth first formed his organization, which soon became one of the 85 affiliates of our Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Bull Connor doubtless regarded our group as just another branch of troublesome niggers. It soon became obvious even to Connor, however, that Shuttlesworth was in dead, uh, dead earnest. ACHR grew month by month to become the acknowledged basic mass movement of the Birmingham Negro. 
Weekly mass meetings were held at various churches. The meetings were packed. ACHR began working through the courts to compel the city to relax its segregation policies. A suit was instituted to open Birmingham's public relation facilities or recreation facilities to all of its citizens. It was when the city lost this case that the authorities responded by closing down the parks rather than permit Negro youngsters to share facilities maintained by the taxes of black and white alike. Early in 1962, students at Miles College initiated a staggered series of boycotts against downtown white merchants. Shuttlesworth and his fellow leaders of the ACHR joined with the students and helped them to mobilize many of Birmingham's Negroes in a determined withdrawal of business from stores that displayed Jim Crow signs refused to hire Negroes in other than menial capacities, refused to promote the few Negroes in their employ, and would not serve colored people at their lunch counters. As a result of the campaign, business fell off as much as 40% in some downtown stores. Fred was leading a militant crusade, but Birmingham and Bull Connor fought tooth and nail to keep things as they were. As the parent organization of ACHR, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Atlanta had kept a close and admiring watch on Fred Shuttlesworth's uphill fight. We knew that we had paid the price in personal suffering for the battle he was waging. He had been jailed several times. His home and church had been badly damaged by bombs. Yet he had refused to back down. This courageous minister's audacious public defiance of Bull Connor had become a source of inspiration and encouragement to Negroes throughout the South. In the May 1962 board meeting of SCLC at Chattanooga, we decided to give serious consideration to join Shuttlesworth and ACHR in a massive direct action campaign to attack segregation in Birmingham. It happened that we had scheduled that city as the site of our forthcoming annual convention in September. Immediately after uh, the board meeting, rumors began to circulate in Birmingham that SCLC had definitely decided to support Fred's fight by mounting a prolonged campaign in that city at the time of the convention. <clears throat> These rumors gained so much impetus that stories supporting them appeared in the daily press. For the first time, Birmingham businessmen who had pursued a policy of ignoring demands for integration became concerned and concluded that they would have to do something drastic to forestall large-scale protests. Several weeks before our convention was scheduled, the business community began negotiating with ACHR, meeting with the White Senior Citizens Committee, where Shuttlesworth, Dr. Lucius Pitts, President of Miles College, A.G. Gaston, wealthy businessman, and owner of the Gaston Motel. Arthur Shores, an attorney with wide experience on civil rights cases. The Reverend 
Edward Gardner, Vice President of ACHR and Insurance Broker John Drew. After several talks, the group came to some basic agreements. As a first step, some of the merchants agreed to remove the Jim Crow signs from their stores, and several actually did so. The businessmen further agreed to join a suit with, in a suit with ACHR to seek nullification of city ordinances forbidding integration of lunch counters. It appeared that a small crack had opened in Birmingham. Although wary of the permanence of these promises, the Negro group decided to give the merchants a chance to demonstrate their good faith. Shuttlesworth called a press conference to announce that a moratorium had been declared on boycotts and demonstrations. However, to protect the position of ACHR, he made it clear that his organization's parent body, SCLC, would be coming to Birmingham for its convention as planned and informed the press that after the convention, SCLC would be asked to return to the Steel City to help launch an action campaign if the pledges of the business community were violated. Bull Connor had been issuing ominous statements about our forthcoming meeting when he realized that his threats were frightening to no one, he began to try to intimidate the press by announcing that the press cards of any outside reporters would be taken away from them. It was clear that Connor felt the bastions of segregation could be most securely maintained in Birmingham if national exposure could be avoided. The SCLC convention took place in September of 1962 as scheduled. Shortly thereafter, Fred Shuttleworth's fears were justified. The Jim Crow signs reappeared in the stores. The rumor that was that Bull Connor had threatened some of the merchants with loss of their licenses if they did not restore the signs. It seemed obvious to Fred that the merchants had never intended to keep any of their promises. Their token action had merely been escalated to stall off demonstrations while SCLC was in the city. During a series of lengthy telephone calls between Birmingham and Atlanta, we reached the conclusion that we had no alternative but to go through our proposed combined action campaign. Along with Fred Shuttlesworth, we believed that while a campaign in Birmingham would surely be the toughest fight of our civil rights careers, it would, if successful, break the back of segregation all over the nation. This city had been the country's chief symbol of racial intolerance. A victory here might well set forces in motion to change the entire course of the drive for freedom and justice. Because we were convinced of the significance of the job to be done in Birmingham, we decided that the most thorough planning and prayerful preparation must go into the effort. We began to prepare a top secret file which we called Project C the C for Birmingham's confrontation 
with the fight for justice and morality in race relations. In preparation for our campaign, it called, I called a three-day retreat and planning session with SCLC staff and heard members at our training center near Savannah, Georgia. Here we sought to perfect a timetable and discuss every possible eventuality. In analyzing for campaign in Albany, Georgia, uh, we decided that one of the principal mistakes we had made there was to scatter our efforts too widely. We had been so involved in attacking segregation in general that we had failed to direct hardcore communities, uh, direct our protest effectively to any of the major, to any one major facet. We concluded that in hardcore communities, a more effective battle could be waged if it was concentrated against one aspect of the evil and intricate uh, system of segregation. We decided, therefore, to center the Birmingham struggle on the business community. For we knew that the Negro population had sufficient buying power so that a withdrawal would make the difference between profit and loss for many businesses. Stores with lunch counters were our first target. There is a special humiliation for the Negro in having to his money accepted at every department in a store except the lunch counter. Food is not only a necessity but a symbol and our lunch counter campaign had not only a practical but a symbolic importance. Two weeks after the retreat at our training center, I went to Birmingham with my able executive assistant, the Reverend Wyatt T. Walker, and my abiding friend and fellow campaigners, uh, campaigner from the days of Montgomery, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy. SCLC's treasure. There, is, there we began to meet with the board of ACHR to assist in preparing the Negro community for what would surely be a difficult, prolonged, and dangerous campaign. We met in the now famous Room 30 at the Gaston Motel, situated on 5th Avenue North in the Negro Ghetto. This room, which housed Ralph and myself, and served as the headquarters for all of the strategy sessions in subsequent months, would later be the target of one of the bombs on the fateful and violent Saturday night of the 11th of May, the eve of Mother's Day. The first major decision we faced was setting the date for the launching of Project C, since it was our aim to bring pressure to bear on the merchants. We felt that our campaign should be mounted around the Easter season, the second biggest shopping period of the year. We started the first week of March. We would have six weeks to mobilize the community before Easter, which fell on the 14th of April. But at this point, we were reminded that a major, that a mayorality 
election was to be held in Birmingham on the 5th of March. The leading candidates were Albert Gloucester Boutwell, Eugene Bo O'Connor, and Tom King. All were segregationists running on a platform to preserve the status quo. Yet both King and Boutwell were considered moderates in comparison to Connor. They were hopeful that Connor would be so thoroughly defeated that at least we would not have to deal with him. Since we did not want our campaign to be used as a political football, we decided to postpone it, planning to begin demonstrations two weeks after the election. Meanwhile, Wyatt Walker was detailed to return to Birmingham and begin work in the mechanics of the campaign. From then on, he visited Birmingham periodically unannounced, organizing a transportation corps and laying the groundwork for an intensive boycott. He conferred with lawyers about the city code on picketing, demonstrations, and so forth, gathered data on the probable bail bond situation and prepared for the injunction that the that was certain to come in addition to scheduling workshops on nonviolence and direct action techniques for our recruits Wyatt familiar familiarized himself with downtown Birmingham not only plotting the main streets and landmarks Target stores, city hall, post office, etc., but meticulously surveying paths of ingress and egress. In fact, Walker detailed the number of stools, tables, and chairs to determine how many demonstrators should go to each store. His survey of the downtown area also included suggested secondary stores in the event we were blocked from reaching our primary targets. By the 1st of March, the project was in high gear and loose ends of organizational structure were being pulled together. Some 250 people had volunteered to participate in the initial demonstration and had pledged to remain in jail at least five days. At this point, the results of the 5th of March election intervened to pose a serious new problem. No candidate had won a clear victory. There would have to be a runoff vote to be held the first week in April. We had hoped that it would be a that if a runoff resulted, it would not have been between Batwell, or sorry, that it would have been between Batwell and King. As it turned out, the competing candidates were to be Batwell and Connor. Again, we had to remap strategy. We, and had we moved in while Connor and Boutwell were electioneering, Connor would undoubtedly have capitalized on our presence by using it as an emotion charging issue for his own political advantage, waging a vigorous campaign to persuade the white community that he and he alone would could defend the city's official policies of segregation we might actually have had the effect of helping Connor win. Reluctantly, we decided to postpone the demonstrations until the day after the runoff. 
we would have to move promptly if we were still to have time to affect Easter shopping. We left Birmingham sadly, realizing that after the second delay, this second delay, the intensive groundwork we had done in the Negro community might not ha uh, bring the effective results we sought. We were leaving some 200,000 and, or sorry, some 250 volunteers who had been willing to join our ranks and to go to jail. Now we must lose contact with those recruits for several weeks. Yet we dared not remain. It was agreed that no member of the SCLC staff would return to Birmingham until after the runoff. In the interim, I was busy on another preparatory measure. Realizing the difficulties that lay ahead, we felt it was vital to get the support of key people across the nation. We addressed confidential letters to the National Association for the advancement of color people, the Congress of Racial Equality, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the Southern Religion or the Southern Regional Council, telling them of our plans and advising them that we might be calling on them for aid. We corresponded in the same vein for 75, with the 75 religious leaders of all faiths who had joined us in Albany, in the Albany movement. In New York City, Harry Belafonte, an old friend and supporter of SCLC, agreed to call a, a meeting at his apartment. Approximately 75 New Yorkers were present. They were a cross-section of citizens, including newspapermen, who kept their promise not to publish stories about the meeting until the action was launched. Clergymen, business and professional people, and unofficial representatives from the offices of Mayor Wagner and Governor Rockefeller. Fred Shuttlesworth and I spoke of the problem of then existing in Birmingham and those we anticipated. We explained why we had delayed taking action until after the runoff and why we felt it was necessary to proceed with our plans, whether Connor or Boutwell was the eventual victor. Shuttlesworth Wearing the scars of earlier battles brought a sense of the danger as well as the earnestness of our crusade into the peaceful New York living room. Although many of those present had worked with SCLC in the past, there was a silence almost like the shock of a fresh discovery when Shuttlesworth said, you have to be prepared to die before you can begin to live. When we had finished, the most frequent question was, what can we do to help? We answered that we were certain to need tremendous sums of money for Bellbox. We might need public meetings to organize more support. On the spot, Harry Belafonte organized a committee and money was pledged the same night. For the next three weeks, Belafonte, who never does anything without being totally involved, gave unlimited hours to organizing people and money. 
Throughout the subsequent campaign, he talked to, with me and my aides two or three times a day. It would be hard to overestimate the role his, this sensitive artist played at the success of the Birmingham Crusade. Similar meetings were held with two of our strongest affiliates, the Western Christian Leadership Conference in Los Angeles and the Virginia Christian Leadership Conference in Richmond. Both pledged uh, and gave their unswerving support to the campaign. Later on, with the NAACP and up the other local organizations, the Western Conference raised the largest amount of money, some 75000 which has never been raised in a single rally for SCLC. Many of the men from these conferences would later join our ranks during the crisis. With these contacts established, the time had come to return to Birmingham. The runoff election was April the 2nd. We flew in the same night. By word of mouth, we set uh, about trying to make contact with our 250 volunteers for an unadvertised meeting. About 55, or about 65 came out. The following day, with this modest task force, we launched the, the direct action campaign in Birmingham. So, yeah. First, before we get into talking about the piece, again, there was a certain word in there, but you know how I feel. It needs to be used for purely the historical effect. I don't like the, using the word. I don't like the word itself, but in a historical context, it's it makes them makes much more sense to use it than trying to self censor. Now, that said, yeah, they proceed to Birmingham to take on the city in an attempt to weaken Jim Crow laws and segregation there. Even though one of the most staunch adversaries of integration uh, was running for mayor, Bull Connor. Perhaps in the next chapter, we'll see how the clash goes down. But yeah, that'll be it for this episode. As always, educate thyself. Think, read, study, learn. Someone tries to tell you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. I'll see you all in the next video. Until then, later.